Good evening, everyone. My name is Peter Gerlach, and I am the Executive Director of the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council and a lecturer here in International Studies at the University of Iowa. Thank you for joining us in person and via live stream today. We are thrilled to co-host uh, this important program. Wow, that's... Uh, in partnership with the American Security Project, a nonpartisan organization in Washington, D.C., as well as three of our most long-standing campus partners, the University's International Programs, Public Policy Center, and the Center for Asian and Pacific Studies. For those not familiar with ICFRC, we are an independent, nonpartisan organization that hosts speaker programs, community forums, and educational experience to help Iowans better understand international issues and foster global engagement. Our vision is to connect our community across the state to inspire lifelong learning about the global and local issues that matter and to model the inclusive and informed discussion our world needs. I invite you to find us online and help support our mission. In this, our 40th year, we are keenly focused on hosting programs like this one that address global challenges such as climate change. In Iowa, across this country, and around the world, combating the great challenges of our time must begin with access to and the sharing of reliable information, open conversation about the high stakes of inaction, and importantly, intentional planning for the collective action needed to save our planet. I hope you share with your family, friends, neighbors, and colleagues what you learn here tonight, and in so doing, continue these truly needed discussions. With that, I'd like to introduce our esteemed panel for tonight's program, Climate Security as National Security, Climate Change and the, Na and the Hawkeye State. Mike Franken is a retired Vice Admiral in the U.S. Navy. He retired in 2017 after a career that included serving as Deputy Head of U.S. Africa Command in the Strategy and Plans Office of U.S. Central Command, as Chief of Legislative Affairs in the Department of the Navy, and various posts with the Joint Staff and Office of the Secretary of Defense. Rob Hogue is a retired State Senator from Lynn County. Following law school, he served as Judicial Clerk for the Honorable Donald P. Lay, Judge of the Eighth Circuit of Court Appeals, and for the Honorable Michael J. Malloy, then Chief Judge of the District Court for the Northern District of Iowa. In Cedar Rapids, he worked as a lawyer in private practice and served 20 years in the Iowa legislature, where he was a leader for flood relief and recovery, hazard mitigation, renewable energy, clean water, and climate action. In 2013, he wrote a book, America's Climate Century, What Climate Change Means for America in the 21st Century, and what Americans can do about it. Sarah Mitchell is Professor of Political Science in the College of Law and Collegiate Fellow at the University of Iowa. She is the author of seven books, including Domestic Law Goes Global, Legal Traditions and International Courts, and What Do We Know About War? And she has published more than 60 journal articles and book chapters. She is the recipient of several major research awards from the Department of Defense, National Science Foundation, and the United States Agency for International Development. And our moderator, Jessica Lemo, is Director of Climate Security Programs at the American Security Project. She is a national security professional with 15 years of experience at the nexus of complex global issues. Ms. Lemo has provided critical support to a variety of state, federal, and international programs, radiological and nuclear-related disaster response, emergency preparedness, and building partnership capacity programs. Please help me give them all a warm Iowa City welcome. for joining us here today uh, and thanks for the warm welcome it's my first time in Iowa so I really I really appreciate uh, the nice weather uh, and this beautiful venue thanks to everybody also who's joining us online um, I don't think we have a way to integrate your questions online uh, but the way this is gonna work is I will moderate some discussion with our panelists 
uh, first for about a half hour, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So uh, if any of you know any of our panelists uh, or want to get, I think, some bonus points maybe in some of their classes, <laughs> um, you might ask a question or two. Um, so today uh, is an auspicious day uh, for those not in the know. Uh, the United States has released its fifth national climate assessment, which discusses the science behind uh, what is happening with climate change. Uh, it's very relevant. It's quite dense. It's over 2,000 pages. So I recommend uh, the podcast that sort of talks you to the highlights or the summary. Um, <clears throat> but a lot of it is stuff that we've already know. But this is really about action at this point. Uh, and one of the things that we want to stress uh, at ASP as an organization is that this is a bipartisan issue. We are a nonpartisan nonprofit organization and, and we at ASP travel around the country hosting what we call our National Climate Security Tour. We've been doing this since 2014 and we convene these panels and events uh, in order to foster the discussion, to ask the questions uh, in a friendly environment where you can truly ask the questions. Uh, to our dismay, uh, I think this issue has become increasingly partisan. And one of the things that I hope that we can talk through today is why this is a, a nonpartisan issue and, and what's already being done uh, in, in this vein. So uh, with that, I will start the discussion here and I will pitch uh, the first question to Admiral Franken. Uh, DOD has been working on, the Department of Defense, excuse me. If I say acronyms, I'm really sorry. Um, the Department of Defense has been working on climate issues since at least the early 2000s. It's been labor, labeled as a threat multiplier. Uh, can you talk us through what that means and why the Department of Defense is concerned about climate change? Well, um, thank you, Jessica. So, uh, Rob, I wanted to ask first and foremost, though, um, what would Iowa be like if the capital would have stayed here? <laughs> Something to think about. Um, so a threat multiplier is, it's a compounding issue associated with strife worldwide. Uh, it, it, it sometimes stimulates strife, but oftentimes it is in the background of what causes maybe a long-term uh, regional conflict between peoples, between races, between religions. Uh, sometime to the way of life. Think what happened in the United States, for instance, uh, the herders and the planters, who in the 1860s and 80s and two, up, to two, to, up to 1910 or so, there was a struggle as to who owned the land and, and how their uh, line of work would, would uh, be affected. So in Africa, for instance, as the Sahal makes its way further south, and that takes away the grazing lands, and they encroach upon uh, areas of, say, uh, Central African Republic and uh, Chad. Uh, Nigeria is a hotbed for such activity. That brings in groups like Boko Haram, who use the, uh, the, the struggle between herders and planters. Years ago, they were not armed with AK-47s. Today, they are. And what doesn't reach U.S. press is sometimes these war warring groups of men uh, sometimes have 100 murders in a night. And climate change is that instigator. It's that threat multiplier which causes these problems in so many respects. And Dr. Mitchell, you've written some books about, about the evolution of conflict uh, and, and what, what is being projected. Can you talk a little bit about what your research is showing and what you are, I guess, most concerned with in terms of climate change and conflict? Yes, yeah, so political scientists have spent a lot of time studying how climate change is affecting both war between countries and war within countries. Um, and so, the, first of all, starting with the Civil War research, the findings are very mixed. So some studies find that climate change, like higher temperatures on average, increase the risk for political violence. Other studies show that there is no relationship <laughs> between those variables uh, once you model the relationship properly. Um, and so in the Civil War literature, there's been, a, I think, more of a focus on threat multiplier, as you called it. So maybe when a climate change happens in a place like Syria, uh, it's it's triggering other factors that are already present for civil war. So things like ethnic dominance by a smaller group or a lower GDP per capita or the government not providing food and fuel subsidies to people after the drought happened in Syria. Um, so on the one hand, uh, 
the research is kind of mixed, but we can point to cases where threat multipliers uh, certainly increase risks. On the interstate war side, uh, a lot of people in the 80s predicted that water wars would be the wars of the future. Uh, but water wars never really uh, came about. Uh, so Israel took the headwaters of the Latani in its conflict with Lebanon. It took the headwaters of the Jordan in the Six-Day War, and people pointed to those as cases where uh, water was an issue that was causing more interstate conflict. But if you look at what's happened since then, uh, most uh, water conflicts have been resolved peacefully. Uh, and so uh, we've seen more cooperative treaties uh, and less militarized engagement over river basins, for example. Uh, in the maritime sphere, though, there is more militarization. So about one in three uh, diplomatic conflicts between governments over maritime areas become militarized. Uh, that's compared to about one in 10 for river basins. Uh, land borders are still the most contested issues for war. So about one in two, about 50, close to 50% of all land borders that are contested end up in some kind of militarized conflict or war. Um, this is why Russia's taking of the Crimea and invasion of Ukraine is very problematic because it's challenging territorial integrity norms uh, and, and potentially leading to more land disputes. And we find in our research that Climate volatility, so years with you know, really big droughts and really big floods, those tend to increase these kind of land disputes between countries. Uh, and so climate change is having an effect on the chances for conflict between countries. And I think um, a lot of the conflict literature focuses on civil wars, but maybe we're, we should be looking more at conflict between countries. I'm really glad that you brought that up because I'm going to kind of address the elephant in the room, and that is China. We'll just go ahead and jump right into that. Uh, China operates a 17,000 ship distant water fishing fleet that, you know, may not feedback uh, may not directly impact Iowa, but it does impact food security. They are encroaching on exclusive environmental zones, uh, and it's impacting fisheries up in the United States and Alaska uh, with the melting Arctic, and there's more activity. So Admiral Franken or Dr. Mitchell, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about those threats and, and how to perceive them and how to potentially mitigate them? Well, it's, interestingly, thank you for that. The, interestingly, one of the first uh, international uh, agreements made was I think in the 14th century, and it had to do with fishing of cod. And um, and there's a, it's some interesting uh, stories associated with that uh, regarding the Basque fishermen and the like, and, and Henry Hudson up in, up in North America, et cetera, which are comical if you ever want to read the books about it. But um, the, the fishing associated with, let's say, the Gulf of Guinea, um, the, the Chinese fishing vessels hang right off the, the exclusive economic zone until nightfall, race in, send their little disciple ships out uh, to sane the seas of anything living, bring them back to the mothership. The mothership goes outside by morning time and uh, farms cans the fish, casts away the remnants, and the open sea causes all that bio uh, problematic issues. And then that combined with the small mom and pop refineries in the coastal waters, uh, the single or the dual um, use uh, uh, refining processes of oil, sending the waste oil in the littoral waters, which chases the fisheries out farther and causes a compounding issue associated with fishing. Uh, we have, I believe, in Africa alone, uh, something on the neighborhood of 200 million people rely on fish as their primary source of protein. Uh, that number is growing. The problem is fishermen have to go further out, fisherwomen, however, and uh, Frankly, what they're meeting out there in the, in, the, in the good fishing grounds are Chinese vessels. Now, just so we're all square here, uh, China is rather late to the game of illegal fishing. Um, <laughs> uh, Europeans have been artful in that process through the, through the decades, uh, as have other nations. 
Uh, it's just that they've found other means and they can buy it. It's interesting though with fish, it's not uncommon for a fish to be caught off the coast of Peru, to be flown to uh, China, to be dressed out, or Vietnam, and then flown back in the United States and served, ne having never been frozen. So it's a, uh, it's a highly artful business, and uh, we should ask more often where that fish came from, and was it, uh, was it ecologically uh, and sustainably caught, much like we ask questions about where our beef comes from. And we don't. Yeah, and a lot of the techniques that illegal fishers use are really damaging to the sustainability of fisheries. So they often engage in blast uh, fishing, which is using dynamite on coral reefs. Um, and that obviously harms the artisanal fishermen in those areas. Um, we also find that in some of our work that the presence of illegal fishing also increases piracy. Uh, and this is because uh, if fishermen are displaced from doing their usual fishing activities, then they sometimes turn to uh, criminal gangs or other forms of piracy. Um, and so, you know, you certainly think about Somalia as the case where that happened a lot, but you can think about other cases like in the Gulf of Guinea or Nigeria. Um, or, or even around Indonesia, you've seen uh, corruption in, in areas where people are turning to crime in less governed areas. Um, and also where there's contested maritime boundaries, there's, more, uh, there's a bigger problem with piracy because uh, countries don't want to, their fishermen don't want to get close to these contested borders. And so uh, you see a fisher moving across contested EEZ lines that that can both increase militarized conflict between the, the two countries, but you can also get more piracy in those cases because it's harder for the, the navies and the coast guards to, right, to monitor close to these contested borders. Thank you, and, and bringing it a little closer to home, obviously, ocean waters are warming, fish stocks are going farther north, and so what we're seeing on the Department of Defense side is that the U.S. Coast Guard is now having to patrol a lot more frequently, right? They're doing a lot more boarding operations, and so there's a spent cost there in terms of readiness, right? It's a zero sum. If you're not doing X, you're doing Y. So if there's an increase there, are we able to increase that capacity? Uh, but you mentioned something that I want to pivot to now, and that's food security. And, and Mr. Hogue, I would like to bring you in here. I said your name right. Um, I'd like to bring you in here to talk a little bit more about food security. We're in Iowa. Obviously, agriculture is a huge issue. We've got the Farm Bill coming up. Um, can you talk us through why food security is so important, what it means, what it means for the people of Iowa, for the nation. Um, talk us through that process. Sure. I think you've got a mic down there if you want that one. Well, uh, good evening, everybody, and it's great to be with you. Uh, great to be back at the University of Iowa. Go Hawks. Let me just put that out there on the record. Um, so uh, food security is obviously a very big issue, and I, I, I think uh, uh, the other speakers have done a really good job of discussing uh, the global ramifications. My education about the global security implications of climate change was I was speaking in uh, Mount Pelier, Vermont, uh, on a book tour through New England that included eight days in New Hampshire. But I was in Mount Pelier, Vermont, and somebody raised their hand and said, have you thought about the climate, ca uh, climate change uh, roots of the, of the crisis in Syria? This was in 2013. And of course, I hadn't, and so I studied up on that and read about it, and a lot of great literature connecting that historic drought in Syria and the displacement of people um, uh, out of the rural areas into the cities primarily, and then, and then the conflict uh, in Syria. And then I was speaking about that the next year uh, in uh, Toledo, Ohio, and uh, somebody raised their hand and said, have you looked at the climate change roots of the border crisis in this country? And of course I hadn't, and uh, she was a professor at the University of Toledo and said she interviews people seeking refugee status on the southern border here routinely, and almost always, it's not the only cause, but almost always there's a climate disaster in Central America behind those stories. So huge international effort, and issue, and, and concern, and of course, 
um, food security is a, is a very real issue. Uh, it, is, it is a very real issue for people for a lot of reasons. And climate change is one of those uh, issues that override, overrides it and magnifies it. And here's, here's the thing. I was really interested in Sarah's research on conflict. That's on the climate change we've seen to f 10 years ago, to five years ago, because your research, you're always trying to keep current. And we are now entering a period of much more accelerated and impactful uh, heating of the, of the world and climate impacts. Um, now, this year, we've had four years of drought in Iowa. Uh, um, we had a derecho in 2020. Um, I live on the southeast side of Cedar Rapids, 15 acres, lost, I don't know, somewhere between 100 and 200 trees in that derecho. And so I thought, well, I'm gonna replant trees. Easier said than done when you're in the middle of a four-year drought. And, and even though you're hearing reports right now that the corn harvest was okay despite the drought, you'll hear those. I learned from an Iowa State professor, Rick Cruz, that okay harvests aren't good enough because all the people who do agricultural planning assume that every year in Iowa is gonna be a new record. And every year, corn harvests are going to go up by 2% or more. And the fact is, is because of climatic change and drought and flooding and the stresses we're seeing, it is harder and harder to maintain that 2% annual increase. And of course, there are all sorts of other issues associated with uh, food and making sure that we're, we're uh, raising food that people want to eat and doing it in a, in a way that is sustainable. The Farm Bill is an extraordinary opportunity for this Congress, assuming they don't shut us down, shut our government down, uh, and can keep it functioning, right? And that's a big assumption. But assuming they can get back to some sense of normalcy on the legislative process, the Farm Bill really does speak to climate change, and it is one of the big opportunities. Will the conservation funding that was in the Inflation Reduction Act be continued, made permanent? Um, will the Rural Energy for America program be strengthened? Um, will we do more to uh, uh, support programs that are focused on food production in the local food system? There are a lot of issues there, and one of the things that, that people um, can be doing right now is speaking up with members of Congress uh, on, a, on a nonpartisan basis. Just, just say, hey, we want climate action to be part of that bill. And do we have uh, anyone here from Congresswoman Miller Meek's office or Senator Ernst's office? I know that they were planning to attend. Um, oh, great! Thank you for being here. Uh, this is this is something that, uh, at least on the defense side, you know, climate action has really had a bipartisan buy-in, right? So the Department of Defense has always had a resilience program. They're they're concerned about the resilience of both installations. They're concerned about energy security. And I would just like to say, I'm not sure, are you from Senator Ernst's office? Yes. OK, thank you for being here today. Uh, Congresswoman Miller Meeks is someone, I believe this is her district, and um, she is the vice chair of the Conservative Climate Caucus. And I have actually had the pleasure to meet her a few times. Um, and this is really, truly something that we can, we can all get behind and continue that bipartisan nature of it. So hopefully we're, we're able to see that. And again, I think the call to action is, is apropos. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about, or pivot a little bit more to the impacts that we're already seeing. Um, when we talked offline, you had mentioned what had happened at Offutt Air Force Base. Can you talk uh, about the, the flooding at Offutt? Yeah, um, so in 2019, I guess, um, due to freezing and, and lots of snow um, and rain preceding all that, um, the, the Missouri River really flooded badly. And, and it, it was the old fashioned that I remember in the 60s, I was born and raised in Northwest Iowa, we, we would see the Sioux and the, and the Rock and the Missouri flood out of their banks. But over the years with less snow, uh, that occurred infrequently. Matter of fact, hardly occurs at all. But the flooding of uh, the Missouri, uh, which, which didn't re uh, recede until uh, months and months, a half a year later, 
uh, destroyed major portions of Offutt Air Force Base, heretofore never done before, and conservatively speaking, $700 million of damage, but it was probably well north of a billion dollars damage. Now that's just a single uh, case of a place where we didn't expect flooding to occur, when in fact, there are tens, there's actually um, hundreds of military facilities worldwide, the US is responsible for, that have some aspect of climate change which uh, is debilitating to the, to the uh, facility. And this is getting progressively worse. In the United States, for instance, since 1980 to 2022, uh, asymptotically, over billion dollar uh, storms have increased. And I believe since 1980 to today, something on the neighborhood of $1.5 trillion of storm damage has occurred. Um, and we study things like the probability of a Cat 5, I'm, I'm on the Defense Science Board as a co-leader uh, advisor. And this is a group of uh, some of the, this nation's finest scientists looking at the impacts and the adaptation necessary for the nation across the broad spectrum from, um, from food security to international relations to um, securing raw materials for the future to moving of bases and facilities and opening up the Arctic and a host of things. Like for instance, is country A, which has been a supporter of the United States, will it become less so in the future or Conversely, uh, for the United States, I'll put it in, in verbal terms, will Chile be more important to the United States in the future than Saudi Arabia? And the answer to that is perhaps yes. So we are looking f at that and uh, we'll brief the results out here shortly. Um, but across the domain of these studies and that DOD is looking, uh, the Department of Defense is looking at what we must do um, off at Air Force Base is just a small smidgen, um, like Tidewater, Virginia, where the largest, the world's largest Navy base is, uh, and the nuclear infrastructure for our nuclear ships is headquartered. That particular uh, shipyard was closed 18 times last year due to flooding, and, and they had no bad storms. It only gets worse. So when you think about a Cat 5 hurricane hitting Miami, and going up through Orlando, through Tampa, into the Caribbean, re-strengthening to a Cat 5 and hitting Louisiana again, what's the implications to this country? What's the implications to our national security to lose all those facilities? Florida has seven major or something military facilities. Um, and, and besides, the city of Miami will be decimated, as will perhaps Tampa. Um, I can go on on this issue, uh, but it, it is a, it's a very compromising, and the military would like, I, I believe, uh, because of our nonpartisan aspect, wants to lead in sounding the alarm that we must do something. Yeah, and I'll just add on to that. Uh, I'll take moderator's privilege here for just a minute. ASP has a dedicated line of programming in Florida because they have actually more than 20 military installations and bases. Uh, in 2018, famously, uh, Air, uh, Tyndall Air Force Base was essentially leveled by Hurricane Michael. Um, and that's created, and why is that an issue, right? Uh, in simple terms, that's the F-22 Enterprise is based there. They've had to move the aircraft, all of the maintainers, all of their families, you know, military installations aren't, aren't a, a uh, cordoned off thing, right? They live in communities. They're, they're, um, most people don't realize this, that most installations are tied to the energy infrastructure that is in the community. So they, they rely on commercial power. So energy disruptions that affect the community affect the base as well. So um, they're working on resilience and we can talk about energy security <laughs> if you so, want, which so, I guess we so do. Something comical if I may if I bring Absolutely. it up. A, a very uncomfortable situation as a naval officer when you're a captain of a ship and a hurricane's going to strike where you're based. My job is to keep the ship safe and my crew. So we leave. So the wife, have at it. Um, kids, good luck to you all. Um, buy buckets, uh, fill, the, fill, the, fill the, uh, the, the bathtub with water in case you need it. And uh, this is what happens with remarkable frequency.
Yeah, and we just, and I, I sort of grimaced a little because I actually live in Hampton Roads, so when you talk about the flooding, it's, it literally hits home. Um, but, but all of that is to demonstrate that we're already seeing these impacts, and this is certainly something that domestically the Department of Defense and all of the military institu institutions are thinking about and trying to plan for. Um, let's go into a little bit more about energy security, uh, if we will. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, how Russia's invasion of Ukraine has impacted how we think about energy security on the global stage? Oh, well, I was just going to say on the earlier point that uh, we have a lot of military bases around the world, too. So as disasters become more frequent and deadly, that's also affecting our operational capacity abroad. And I think one of the reasons why the U.S. military is using the Coast Guard more actively in global operations, right, to, to deal with, with some of these situations um, it's also the case that if we reach a tipping point where something like the Greenland uh, ice sheet or the Antarctic ice sheet melts, uh, we're talking about a massive increase in sea level. Uh, and that uh, the way that maritime boundaries are drawn, they are ambulatory, meaning that if the land shifts inward, so does the maritime area that's claimed. And as you might imagine, countries now are trying to scramble to keep hold of the current claims that they have so that if the, if the land moves in, inland that they can still uh, have the 200 nautical miles uh, area of access that they have. And, and you have countries like Tuvalu, which just signed an agreement with Australia to migrate their entire population uh, to Australia if if the islands go under. And so so I think it'll be interesting to see how, uh, whether you know maritime conflicts become more contentious, as you were saying, it, like we're just kind of getting to the point where these threat multipliers could really increase. And I also think water wars, I mean, we have cities like Cairo and Cape Town and London that are projected to run out of water in the next 20 years. Um, so you could imagine that, uh, you know, Egypt might get a, a lot more aggressive on the Nile uh, if Cairo's entire water supply gets threatened. So um, I sound like a doom and gloom, so I think I'll stop there. <laughs> No, but, I mean, we're seeing that domestically as well, right? I mean, if you look at, at West um, with the Colorado River Basin, the federal government has had to issue several mandates to say, you know, states play nice together because of the agricultural impacts and, and different ways of managing or mismanaging the water resources there. Um, and I know that there's an entire chapter dedicated to that in the, the climate assessment, but, but go ahead. Well, well I'll just, on the, on the question about energy security, sure. I, 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 I hesitate on that because the question was specifically about Russia and Ukraine, and I don't want people here to think I'm an expert on Russia and Ukraine, although th th there is an issue when you have dependence on countries that are energy exporters, as not necessarily the Uni United States does, but allies do, and that ha that is a real challenge. It has led to the United States doing things that appear to climate activists here as being negative. For example, um, disputes right now over, uh, over liquefied natural gas exports. Well, that's a bad thing from the climate perspective, but I think the reason that those exports are being pursued is in part to displace what Russia was doing for Europe. And so it becomes very complicated, but, but w whatever the complications, what we know is this. First of all, uh, carbon pollution is, is too high in the atmosphere already and is going higher rapidly and we have not effectively slowed it down. We may be have stopped the increase, but that's a maybe, right? And, and so we're going up about 2.4 parts per million per year on, on, on carbon pollution in the atmosphere. And, and that is a real problem. We have to phase out fossil fuels. And, and just to bring this back to energy security, the good news is we have in this state and in this country generally a rapid improvement on renewable energy technologies and rapid adoption. It is happening so fast, the adoption of solar power uh, especially, that it's kind of hard for those of us who are advocates to even to stay on top of everything that is happening. But I know in the last uh, month, the Wellington Heights Community Church in a neighborhood near mine um, put solar panels on and 
open Cedar Rapids' first resiliency hub, right? And they just, and, and they did it. It was led by some of the young people who used to be in the Sunrise Movement, now working for a nonprofit called Our Future, and they did it. And you look out, uh, Decora, a Lutheran church, just put solar panels on the top, everything energy efficient inside, geothermal, they've planted 40 additional trees and restored uh, uh, a couple acres of prairie on their grounds. And six years from now, they have a six year power purchase agreement, and after that six years, they will never have to pay for electricity or energy again. These solutions work, it is clean, permanent, free energy, and so, you you see this rapid acceleration of it. Um, there's been, there, there is a large increase in the amount of manufacturing of solar power that's happening in this country. That's important for national security reasons. And so I think there's a lot to be optimistic about, but we're up against a wall on climate impacts. Um, you know, I, uh, it was 25 years ago, I remember telling people, well, we really had to put ourselves in a position that we could never go over 450 parts per million. Well, we're over 420, and if we're going up to almost two and a half a year, uh, somebody good at math can do that really quick here, boom, you know, all of a sudden we're under, we're under 10 to, you know, we're under 20 years that we have to make a total transition. Secretary Guterres uh, from the United Nations recently said, if the world's gonna be carbon neutral by 2050, countries like the United States need to be carbon neutral by 2040. That's coming right up. Kids born today are gonna to be graduating from high school in 2042. So there is an urgency to this. There are solutions that are working, energy security solutions that are working, but there's also the urgency to it. And I'm going to give the floor to Dr. Mitchell for one minute, but uh, then we'll pivot to questions. So anybody that has a question, we'll have somebody, I believe, with a microphone. Okay. I was just going to say that the the Arctic, though, has something like 20% of the world's un, unproduced oil and gas reserves. So there's a reason that Russia and China are cooperating, right, to uh, look at oil extraction in the Arctic area. And I would say, uh, I think the U.S. military could be doing more in the Arctic region. We have a lot of strategic positioning in Southeast Asia and the Middle East, but we haven't invested as much in ice-breaking vessels uh, to go into the Northwest Passage and, and the Arctic areas. We have not ratified the Law of the Sea Convention, uh, which puts us at a disadvantage in terms of, you know, both for security purposes and for uh, competing for resources that are in the area outside uh, uh, EEZ areas. And so I, I really do think uh, the United States needs to, you know, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this too, whether you think the, the U.S. Navy is doing a good job with its Arctic strategy or not. It's fair, fair for her to ask me a question. Uh, there is uh, much to do in the Arctic. Uh, the good news is NATO is very much engaged and we are putting liaisons and are working with the NATO Arctic Council frequently. Uh, from an asset perspective, uh, many will say that we need icebreakers. The short of it is by 2045 or so, there will be an entire um, end of summer melt of the entire Arctic. The, the problem associated with the ice of Greenland and Antarctica that we've not touched upon, which is a Navy thing, but it's also a humanity thing, is the lack of the pumping action of the, of the uh, ocean currents, uh, which is hugely impactful for all of us, but certainly uh, Northern Europe. But for instance, earlier this year, the water was 100 degrees off the coast of Florida. Now, from a Navy perspective, you talked about uh, climate with, uh, and the implications of energy with Russia. Well, much like that has affected the manner in which we have to build ships and aircraft and commercial aspects as well for heat transfer purposes, um, there, there are challenges with um, the types of uh, propulsion that we use with ships. I foresee a time when uh, you will not be able to enter port uh, with all the stack gases that are currently used in some of our ships. Uh, we will be pull, pulling those ships in port or we'll have 
other uh, reju rejuvenating means of, of transport for those ships. Uh, we all must do our part. To your question, um, what has happened with Russia, certainly energy is central. What it has done is it contorts other nations' thought processes when they're reliant on another nation's energy as a, as a source provider. And so that's why we saw the foot dragging associated with some of our European partners, because they put all their ducks in that one basket. And, uh, and, and Russia knew that we were going to be laggardly in our response to their invasion of a sovereign country. Uh, and, and, and for the United States was laggardly in our support, et cetera, for other reasons. Uh, but but it, it definitely impacts our thought processes. And as uh, Senator Hoag said, it, it encourages the use, the further use of coal plants and, and other sources and increase the pumping from other nations to take up the, the slack of where we had, where, where uh, the, the Russian market is persona non grata in Europe now. So yes, it's, it's a big challenge. Questions, so just raise your hand and uh, Peter will walk around for you. Uh, first, I want to say, Jessica, welcome to Iowa, where uh, we grow fuel and say we feed the world. Um, my question is in 2020, uh, or after COVID 19, we saw drastic impacts on our uh, global food system right here in the state of Iowa. Um, we were seeing hogs killed in place because we couldn't get them through packing plants. And on the verge of Thanksgiving coming up, we see the bird flu back in Iowa. Um, we're one step away from some biological catastrophe because we've confined all of our livestock and we grow a monoculture of two crops in this state. How do we build resiliency into our state to protect our economy and our, our foods. Thank you. Thank you, and I assume everybody was able to hear that question. Just, uh, so thank you for the question. Uh, it, it, a couple points I wanna make. First of all, the, um, the biological threats or the, the public health threats that are out there are out there. Uh, those, are, those are real, they're recurring. Uh, we need to take them very seriously, and climate change makes every single one of them worse, right? As the climate changes, it puts so much pressure on, on public uh, human health. It also puts a lot of pressure on our natural ecosystems. And you, you, you just put that increasing pressure and accelerating increased pressure, and it, it's very troublesome. In terms of what we can do, to me, uh, I, th I think the, the part of the answer here, here is building resiliency in agriculture and more regenerative agriculture. Uh, Iowa, has, has, uh, Iowa has done um, some things that are helpful. Uh, the emphasis on trying to diversify uh, the processing uh, for animal agriculture I think is a good thing. Uh, I, I talked to farmers who couldn't find a place to process um, you know, birds right, or they were looking at a three hour drive to the nearest locker. So I think there are some things that can be done, but, or have been done, but they're, they're small and they're anecdotal. And what we really need is, is an entire food system that is rewarding diversification and regenerative agriculture. Uh, farmers can be and are leaders in the fight against climate change. Um, and, and we need to lift that up because farmers, farmers can do that. And it's not, it's, it, it, you know, we've, we've done so much where it gets to be, well, it's just about uh, ethanol, right? Well, farm policy shouldn't be just about ethanol. There's a whole diversification, uh, another issue in the, in, the, in the farm bill. What is going to be done to help new beginning and historically marginalized communities be more involved in farming? And there's so much to be done here in terms of that diversification and resiliency. I think that is something that in Iowa we, we should focus a lot on. One other comment, just especially because we have an esteemed guest from out of state here. So, so Iowa's got 35 million acres, 14 million acres in corn, 7 million acres in soybeans, 
roughly, so 60% of our state. And if Iowans only grew food for Iowans to eat, we could probably do that on two or 3% of our land. So we do have the issue of, okay, how do we, how do we um, build an agricultural system? And one of the things I think is underappreciated by Iowans is, we can be a food reservoir for the world, but we've gotta be, we've gotta be conscious about how to do that. So it's not just, oh gosh, we've got a surplus of corn this year, and hopefully someday we get back to routine large surpluses, right? But um, we've got to, so what are we gonna do with it? It's got, we should be more strategic about that and make sure that Iowa is in a position that when there is drought and famine around the world, we're able to quickly and efficiently help fill that need. Thank you, great question. Next. Thank you folks for enlightening us and being here and all of that. My question is um, a little bit out in left field, I think. There's a number that haunts me that I hear various places, some scientific, some not, and I wonder if you have a clarification. I have been reading for a number of years or hearing for a number of years that what we have already created in terms of climate um, setup and how it's going to unfold, we won't see the result of what we've already created for 30 years. Now that scares the you know what out of me. Is that a valid thing and what are the implications of that? So you're speaking of the residual carbon that we've already put in and also the methanes, et cetera. And, and so complicated and I'm the science very much science person here. And, uh, and I'll tell you that the warming of the, of the permafrost and the release of the, the microbes, long, uh, long frozen other uh, flora and fauna, we don't know the implications of that yet. Uh, but also the release of methane, and methane of course is far, far more impactful than, than carbon. Uh, this is a, a fast moving train and from a science, a pure science perspective, we don't know, but we can only postulate. And, and, but I, I will say that the vast majority of studies who have looked at this from all sorts of angles, using different models, different theories, different uh, data sets, going back in time as, as much as we can, using much more space assets today, than we have in the past to more uh, exacting uh, computing capabilities as well. Uh, almost all of those studies have undershot the implications of climate, meaning we thought it was going to be 1.2 degrees Celsius. Oops, it turns out to be 1.35. The best thing we can do is kind of watch things happen and do what we can to fair lead those things, to use a Navy term. And there's, there's many more things we could be doing, and DOD can be more of a leader in this. We are trying, and we are putting, uh, we're putting climate, uh, part, of our, part of our effort is to educate everybody who comes in DOD to make them aware of climate implications and what to expect. I mean, just educating the workforce, and that should be true across America. As I'm driving through campus today, I'm thinking, if I was going to school today as a freshman, would I be, instead of a biomechanical bio, uh, uh, engineering uh, major, wouldn't I be perhaps a, um, a climate engineer? I think perhaps I would, or a hydrologist. Uh, but uh, many of those studies are, are, are affirming that what we've done to ourselves already is not going to be reversible for some time. Um, you, the utility companies, and I'm only familiar with the utility companies in Iowa, if they don't own the solar array, they don't want it. And in, so, in, because it cuts into their market share if they don't own it. Thus, all distributed energy, 
you know, it's, it's individually owned, is at odds with what the utility companies are trying to do. And I wonder if there's some kind of best practices to reconcile these two, uh, um, you know, titans as far as uh, solar adaptation. Uh, I'm going to start off by a real quick little snippet. I, I ran for office in this state. And... <laughs> Um, curiously, uh, the Farm Bureau sends out a, a questionnaire on how you feel about some things. And one of the questions was, will you work against any uh, establishment of solar farms in the state of Iowa? And it didn't say ag only uh, ground, it said any ground. And I'm from the, the Los Hills area of Iowa where there's a lot of ground that should be in solar arrays. Uh, and, and there's planting opportunities and grazing opportunities with solar array farms as well. But that was one of the questions, and it was, I think, a pass-fail, just so you know. Uh, we've got time, I think, uh, if you want to answer, you, you, can, you can contribute, obviously. Um, but we've got time for about two more questions. Uh, just really quick. Um, Look, it's, it's a policy decision, right? It's a policy decision by the utility and by policymakers. In Iowa right now, we have a net metering law, and it's a good law, and we should protect that law. Um, if the utilities wanted to own more solar power, they've had ample opportunities to do that, and the good news is they're starting to do it, but they're doing it on a subscription basis in Cedar Rapids. By the way, consumers already fully subscribe the, cons uh, the the solar garden that Alliant had in Cedar Rapids. I think they've fully subscribed the solar garden that Alliant has in Marshalltown. But those are policy decisions to be made. Uh, somebody once told me uh, utilities are creatures of public policy, and they are. Um, they and and they ebb and flow, but they ebb and flow not they ebb and flow because of what policymakers are telling them. So that is an issue to, to talk to people about. Um, but it doesn't change the fact that solar is cheaper and works. I mean, that is an, sort of an inexorable technological. Who owns it? I guess from a climate perspective, I'm kind of agnostic about it. If the utilities wanted to own it, they could own it. Uh, but they've got to say they want to do it and then meet meet those needs, but we have a net metering in this law, in this state, because the utilities weren't doing it. I'll just add real quick, uh, take a look at what's happening in the state of Maine and what they're doing with their, their electric sector. Yeah. Maine. Mm -hmm. uh, Minnesota, right. Minnesota would be another one. Okay. It's, it's Sorry, go ahead. Uh, Joe Aussie, Veterans for Peace. The Pentagon is the single largest polluter in the world. And uh, we keep talking about doing things about it. Now, the situation in Gaza, Gaza has been, has been bombed five times in 15 years with American bombs. Why are we continuing to allow this to take place when there's far better solutions than just bombing? Thank you. Uh, I wish, I, I agree with you, I, I wish the world were in a place where bombs were not the solution, but unfortunately that's not where we're at. <clears throat> I, I, do, I, I do, first of all, I think we, we all cry out for peace, and uh, what Hamas did was terrible, and the hostages are terrible, and Israel, the impression I have, and I'm not an expert on it, but it seems to be an excessive response that's just killing a lot of people, and what we need is peace. You got multiple parties involved there. Um, pe people in this country seem to think the United States can control that, and I don't think the United States can control it, but I hope the United States can push those parties involved to end that conflict. ASAP, because it is a humanitarian crisis. I want to come back to the point you started with, which is about the Department of Defense being the world's largest uh, climate polluter in the world. And it is the world's largest organization, the Department of Defense. It is enormous. 
there are signs, and maybe, maybe uh, Michael or Sarah can talk about it, but there is a lot of investment in the Department of Defense in clean, renewable energy, which, which the, one of the benefits is secure uh, supply lines. You don't have to, I mean, I remember 20 years ago we talked about people driving, uh, driving resupply trucks through Iraq and coming under attack, right? It is, it is there, are, there are so many more sustainable and hopefully effective alternatives that could reduce that footprint. And, and, and let me just say one other thing. Because a lot of people say, well, we need government to do this or we need the Department of Defense to do it. Look, that's true. We're not going to solve this problem without action by the federal government. But everybody in society has got to say we want to address climate change. Because it, 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 we just, we have, to, we have to do that. It's the family, it's the local government, it's the business, it's the institutions, it's the state governments. As a society, we've got to embrace it. And if the United States could do that and demonstrate the, the economic and environmental and health benefits of doing that, boy, I still believe that it's something that can unite the world for a more peaceful and prosperous future for everyone. And I, I believe that climate action is essential to that. Uh, thank you for your service. Uh, we've got time for one more question. And then we'll be available for a bit after, after we wrap up, if you want to talk to any of the panelists. Hi. Um, first, thank you very much for a wonderful talk, um, all of you. Um, earlier uh, discussion, you mentioned how climate change would affect uh, U.S. Uh, basing overseas. Um, I was wondering, so right now the U.S. has several dozen, or has uh, troops forward deployed to several dozen countries, largely as a deterrent. Uh, I'm wondering if you could speak to what you think uh, climate change will do as far as um, will we need to increase uh, our forward presence, decrease it in the future, how will this affect um, our ability to deter aggression towards ourselves and our allies? Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, one thing I'll say is we did a study looking at whether governments initiate force against rival states when they have disasters at home uh, in a way to divert attention away from poor disaster response. And, and we did find that for countries embroiled in rivalries like India and Pakistan or you know these sort of long historic rivalries that disasters create a danger uh, because it, it, governments can use the foreign policy tools to rally the public around them when they're facing domestic turmoil. So I would say um, if that kind of behavior is happening regularly when climate change or disasters is occurring, then I would think that the chances, uh, you know, uh, countries are essentially engaging in moral hazard. They're being more risky, right, in foreign policy. So, so that could potentially drag, um, you know, U.S. interests into some of these areas in a way that maybe we don't want to be dragged into them. So Syria is a good example of a drought that has caused, uh, in the 2012, the rise of nefarious actors. Um, the, the migration, we haven't talked about the migration of people. Um, it's postulated that there'll be a billion people who'll be moving. It's actually 1.3, I believe. A billion people moving as a result of climate change. Now, in the America, we are so well insulated that we don't speak in these terms. The Europeans do. Very much so. Uh, the continent of Africa has 37% of the world's natural resources. It has 60% of the uh, unused agricultural land that's available. It has the fastest growing population. When I, was work when I first visited Africa in the early 80s, uh, it was 600 million people or so. Now it's 1.4 billion. Uh, Nigeria will transcend America's population, perhaps while I'm still alive. Uh, it is a fast-growing continent that, and, and whatever we do to make ourselves more green in America, it doesn't matter if we don't help the developing nations reach their level, their standard of living that they're entitled to in a, in a far more green manner, not like the West, not like the Industrial Revolution. 
this is this is the biggest issue I can I can pound upon. Um, failing that, uh, India, Central Asia, Southeast Asia, et cetera, will um, put out carbon that we will be, uh, America's actually in a good place in terms of having the resilience socially to, uh, to fix ourselves, but other places less so. And it's gonna cause people to move. And when people move in an uncontrolled manner, it affects um, elections. And then the thing that becomes extinct is democracy. I think that's a great, great note to end on. Thank you so much, everybody, uh, for being here today. Um, uh, if you've got questions, we're around. Thank you so much. <laughs>